Chapter Twelve of the House on the Downs by Gladys Etzen Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Brighton, Rodney Sherrod's absence from the Grange was reported by one of the servants next morning to Sir Quentin and caused the latter distress and anxiety. Mark felt it incumbent upon him to tell how he had seen the young gypsy fellow rush away in the storm to the Downs. Eve, questioned with the others, finally admitted that Rodney had had a little tiff with her because she had failed to appreciate duly one of his violin pieces. She supposed he had probably gone off in a pet. The broken fiddle bore out her story. Sir Quentin remarked forbearingly that he was sure Rodney was trying to control his rather wild temper, and that when he realized he had been rude to Eve, his remorse would bring him back in a contrite mood. "'No doubt the boy'll be back for dinner,' the baronet ended, with a show of optimism. Mark carried out a decision he had come to after worrying over the fact that Cynthia Melsom had telephoned to the green room at the Theatre Royal in Brighton, and had, moreover, evinced a surprising, and, as it seemed to him, a suspicious interest in Irene. He walked over the downs to Lewis, and there took a bus to Brighton. Again he presented himself at the stage door of the Theatre Royal, where, by the judicious investment of another half-crown, he wrung from the reluctant doorkeeper the address at which Irene Grail was stopping. Within a few minutes Mark was ringing the doorbell at Mrs. Peller's theatrical boarding-house in a steep by-street leading off King's Road. The landlady, a stout, sharp-eyed little woman, informed him that Miss Grail already had a caller, but that he could wait if he liked. She ushered him into a comfortably furnished old-fashioned sitting-room liberally ornamented with autographed pictures of actors and actresses. "'I suppose,' she said, viewing him rather hostily, "'you are from one of the newspapers wanting more information about Craddock Rayner?' "'No,' Mark answered. "'I'm an old friend of Miss Grail's.' Mrs. Peller's hostile expression relaxed. "'I am glad to hear that. If those newspaper fellows keep up their libelous insinuations, she'll need friends.' The landlady seated herself and showed signs of a disposition to confidence. "'I don't mind telling you I'll never believe a word against Irene Grail. She's prompt at paying, gives herself no airs, and makes no trouble. I couldn't say the same of Mr. Rayner. But perhaps you didn't know he lodged here, too? I don't like to speak ill of the dead, and murdered at that, but he gave me a good bit of trouble, what with one thing and another. I couldn't bring myself to congratulate Miss Grail when I heard she was going to marry him.' Mark stirred uneasily. "'Would you mind telling me just what you mean, Mrs. Peller?' "'Well, now, I don't see why I shouldn't, as you're a friend of Miss Grail's. To begin with, he owes me for two weeks' lodging. Though what he did with the handsome salary I'm told Miss Grail paid him as her leading man, I'm sure I couldn't say, unless he squandered it on women. Women were wild over him, and he wasn't averse to them, not he. I'm in a position to know. Letters and telephones at all hours. I judge he was in a bit of trouble with one woman— he was very sharp with her on the telephone one day. I couldn't help overhearing. Oh, you'll find this will come out a nasty case, and there'll be those in high life involved, too. There were letters in a woman's handwriting coming to Mr. Rayner that had a crest on the envelope. It was no mere chance took him to that lonely spot he was murdered in. He went to Rotherdean Hollow to meet someone, and that person killed him. Why are you so certain, Mrs. Peller, that he went there by appointment? The landlady assumed an important mien. Those letters with the crest on the envelopes all bore the postmark of Rotherdean Village, only a mile over the downs from the hollow, as perhaps you know. I uh, have been told so, said Mark vaguely, unpleasant suspicions besieging him. They heard someone coming down the stairs. Miss Grail's caller going out, most likely, remarked Mrs. Peller. Now here's an odd thing, she added in a whisper. That same woman called on Craddock Rayner a week ago and had a quarrel with him in this very room the door was closed and locked and i couldn't hear a word of what it was about but it was plain from the sound of their voices that they were quarrelling the woman in a pretty rage too then on the afternoon mr rayner was murdered she comes here and calls on miss grail and now again to-day the landlady broke off abruptly as a woman in a dark tailored suit passed through the hall to the outer door she did not glance into the sitting-room but went out quickly mark however caught a glimpse of her face he was not especially surprised to recognize Cynthia Melsom. "'I'll tell Miss Grail you wish to see her,' said Mrs. Peller, rising. As the landlady stepped into the hall, Irene herself came down the stairs. She looked weary and worried, but forced a smile at sight of Mark. "'You're going out?' he asked disappointedly, observing that she wore a hat. "'Only down on the esplanade to get a breath of sea air. 
I thought it might freshen me up for the evening. I say, mayn't I come too? He begged with almost boyish eagerness. I'm awfully keen on sea air. A warmth came into Irene's tired eyes. Do come, she said simply. They walked on the marine parade. The ocean breezes whipped a dash of color into Irene's cheeks, and the sun brought out the burnished gold glints in her hair. The low tide revealed a strip of sand along the pebbly beach. Irene looked wistfully toward the merry throng of bathers. I'm almost tempted to join them. Come ahead, applauded Mark. We can hire suits. I'm game. Two women approaching them on the esplanade stared deliberately and impertinently at Irene, and then began to whisper and laugh. The shadow settled again on the face of the actress manageress. She quickened her step and passed the two women. It wouldn't do, Mark, she said dispiritedly. I'm notorious enough as it is. Mark glared after the two women. He was suddenly conscious of a desire to commit violence. Don't let that beastly newspaper rot bother you. His tone was almost savage. You'll be vindicated at the inquest, and then we'll start a suit for libel against those blithering reporters. Irene's tightened lips relaxed. She slipped her arm through Mark's. You're rather a dear. I jolly well hope you'll contrive to hang on to that notion. Let's be utterly foolish, she suggested abruptly, with an unsteady little laugh, and come down on the beach and pick up shells. It's such ages since I've done anything like it. I used to love gathering shells, and even crabs, when I was a child. Immense idea, Irene, agreed Mark heartily. No better way to get a wholesome perspective on life than to collect shells and crabs, particularly crabs nothing artificial or ultra-civilized about them. The years rolled back for Mark and Irene that afternoon. From shell-gathering they tried every amusement that Brighton offered, including a ride on the electric railway along the beach from the aquarium to Kemptown, and ending with the flying exhibitions from Volk's seaplane station. The big red-gold ball of the sun was sinking in the far margin of the blue sea, and the cry of the gull sounded weirder and wilder in the gathering shadows as Irene turned reluctantly from the beach. "'You've given me a perfect holiday, Mark. It's been a sort of fairy tale. I've just got to drive myself back to reality.' "'We're going to have a jolly lot more of fairy tales,' insisted Mark, his sunburnt face lighted up like a boy's. The actress manageress smiled a little sadly. "'I wonder. There's the inquest day after tomorrow. Oh, dash the inquest!' Of course, it's no end tragic about Rayner, but you can't do him or yourself any good by brooding over the whole rotten mess. After the inquest, I'm going to make it my business to see that you relegate tragedy into the limbo of forgotten things. And look here, Irene, I know I'm meddling, but I can't help it. You had a woman come to see you today whose acquaintance won't do you any good. To the best of my belief, she's an adventuress. Irene turned eyes, no longer joyous, upon him. You mean Cynthia Melsom? You saw her go out from Mrs. Peller's? She came to see me on business, Mark. For her own gain, not yours, he said with decision. I happen to know she was mixed up in some way with Craddock Rayner, and quarreled violently with him a week ago. She may have had cause, observed Irene in a low tone. Mark looked at her gravely. Was Rayner such a rotter, then? The actress manageress gave a weary little shrug. Rather so. Tell me, Mark, how does Cynthia Melsom get on at Rotherdean Grange? I believe she is lady's maid to Lady Eve, rather, Dean? Mark noted a curious constraint in her voice as she named Lady Eve. Cynthia gets on famously with Sir Quentin, he answered. He won't hear a word against her, mainly, I think, because her father was his father's faithful old gamekeeper. But I don't fancy Miss Cynthia is a prime favorite with the rest of the household. I know she is not with Alwyn Rotherdean, Sir Quentin's brother. Nor with Lady Eve, this sounded more a statement than a query. Well, no, rather not. What is Lady Eve like, Mark? Is she very charming and very beautiful? Oh, she's a beauty right enough. Golden hair, blue eyes, perfect complexion, knows how to be exceedingly charming, when she chooses. That style, you know. A bit of a coquette, is she, Mark? Well, she likes admirers dangling about her. But I say, Irene, why this amazing interest in Lady Eve Rotherdean? Oh, I've heard a great deal about her, she fenced. She is a celebrated personage in this little section of the world. They had reached Mrs. Peller's boarding house. If there is anything I can do to make things easier for you, Mark offered, just let me know. I'm your friend for all time, Irene. That dashed divorce can't prevent us from being friends. Perhaps it will make us all the better friends, she suggested. Perhaps, he conceded. But in any case, I've grown wiser and less bumptious with the years. One does, you know. 
We'll go shell hunting again next week, eh? We'll decide that after the inquest, she evaded. Now what do you mean by that, Irene? His voice holding a sharper intonation. Dear old boy, don't look so tragic. As there is only one day, Sunday, before the inquest, and I want to rest up, we shall have to wait until it is over. Then, too, I ought to show a little decent respect for Craddock Rayner. After all, we were engaged. Yes, said Mark resentfully, and I wish to the Lord you never had been. You can't wish that any more than I do, she answered. End of chapter 12